Good afternoon, uh, participants. Welcome to the International Property Dispute uh, uh, Resolution Series for Mediation and Dispute Resolution uh, Professionals. This afternoon on the 27th day of August 2020. Uh, this is the first uh, part of the tutorial series that we will be having uh, two series. And we commence uh, by uh, reciting the words of the Kenyan National Anthem. O oh God of all creation, bless this our land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity, peace and liberty. Plenty be found within our borders. Uh, once again, participants, uh, welcome to this uh, tutorial that we are having this afternoon. Um, our tutor this uh, afternoon is uh, Mr. William Agan. Uh, Mr. William Agan uh, is uh, an advocate and intellectual property consultant. He is also a lecturer at the Catholic University of East Africa, Faculty of Law. His uh, specialization is intellectual property. He is a registered uh, patent agent uh, at KIPI, a certified professional mediator. Uh, he runs the law firm Agan and Associates. He has been a guest lecturer in IP at the Kenya School of Law. He is a former adjunct lecturer at the Kenya School of Law and the former Dean School of Law at the Kenya School of uh, Professional Studies. Uh, Mr. Agan will be able to take us through the tutorial. As we go along, uh, you are encouraged to use the chat facility for your questions and comments. Uh, the session will have two breaks at the top of the hour, that is at uh, three o'clock and at four o'clock, and uh, we shall hopefully be able to uh, conclude at five o'clock. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Agan. How are you? Good afternoon, uh, Sarah. Very well, thank you. Good to be here. How are you? Uh, thank you very much. Great to have you. Uh, welcome to take us through with the tutorial series. You can proceed to share your thank screen. Thank you very much. Yes. Good afternoon, uh, co colleagues and uh, participants, uh, and welcome to this tutorial. I hope that uh, it will be of benefit to you. As has been indicated, uh, this is my area of specialization, and I have taught the unit for a while, and I'm also a consultant in the same. But today, consider me as your tutor, uh, your teacher, and hopefully uh, we will be able to understand some problem areas in particular in the world of intellectual property. I think before I begin, it is important to know that it's very basic. Uh, and as such, I have tried the best I can to stick to what you will be required to answer come the day of the exam. So I've not veered off much. Where I have veered off, it's just for purposes 
of uh, illustration. We will begin with uh, the seventh module, which usually is a bit, uh, can I say challenging? Uh, let me not use the word difficult. And thereafter, we will go to the other modules. Now, I have infused your primer and your module seven and module one, which is also an introductory uh, session for this particular WIPO course. And as such, we will not be doing module one and will not be going through the primer. So we'll just go straight away to the particular module in question and everything that has been indicated in the, introdu in, in the introductory session, touching on patterns will be covered in this particular module. And the same will also be covered in the other modules. So we'll try the best we can so that you don't feel left out on the introductory part. Now we are doing a WIPO program and uh, World Intellectual Property Organization itself uh, administers very many treaties. And one of the most important treaty touching on patents is the Patent Cooperation Treaty. Now there are regimes that grant patents. Patent Cooperation Treaty on its own that is administered by WIPO does not have anything to do with granting of patents. And I'll explain this as we go. Now there are registration regimes which are national regimes. Uh, for us here in Kenya, we have the our patent office is the Kenya Industrial Property Institute. At the same time, there are regional uh, registration regimes. And when we talk of registration regimes, what we mean here is that when applying for a patent, it is only those offices that ultimately grant a patent to an applicant, to an applicant. Uh, and so it is important for you to understand right from the beginning that it is only those regimes either in the national or regional uh, offices like the EPO, the European Patent Organization and ARIPO, uh, the Africa Regional Intellectual Property Organization that can grant, uh, that can grant patents. Mr. Gan, kindly. Now the laws again. Uh, Mr. Gan, are... kindly. Yes. Uh, did you do your screen share? Yes. yes. Uh, did you do the screen share? Uh, I thought I did. Uh, I, I think I haven't. I haven't. I haven't shared it. No, not yet. Please do. Okay, okay, sorry, 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 sorry for that. No problem, thank you. Sorry for that, uh, sorry, sorry for that. Are we, are we there now? Yes, yes, you can just run the slideshow. Great, thank you. Okay, sorry. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. Yeah, here we go. Uh, as has already been indicated, sorry, participants. Uh, 
for that. As has already been indicated, uh, the Patent Cooperation Treaty is one of the treaties that is concerned with patent, and it is the one that uh, we are more concerned with when it comes to administration of uh, patents from our WIPO office. And uh, those there are the regional regimes that uh, I mentioned, and they are national, there are national uh, regimes under national laws, and there are regional uh, regimes under regional uh, protocols and agreements. And those are some of the examples so that I don't uh, repeat them. And yes, this is where we were. Now we have national laws and regional laws that inform the manner in which patents can be uh, registered and granted by those various uh, offices. Uh, as I had indicated, let me explain exactly how WIPO comes in. Now, from the international treaty, the Patent Cooperation Treaty, we have what is called a single filing system. Now, that single filing system makes it easy for an applicant of a patent to lodge that patent via WIPO, and then it leaves WIPO to then help that applicant to then lodge the same in different countries for grant of patent. That is the reason why at the beginning, I did indicate that WIPO in itself does not grant but administers. Now, this is very useful because when an applicant wants a grant of patent in a certain country, ideally, given that patent is territorial, it would then mean that the applicant lodges several applications in every country where he wants protection. So WIPO comes in, in that all the applicant has to do is to designate, is to designate the country where the applicant needs protection and WIPO will then do the same through a single filing. Otherwise, if it is not for that, then it would mean that the applicant has to make multiple national or regional applications. Now, the duration of patent protection is 20 years. And uh, again, as an explanation here is that 20 years is minimum protection that has been provided by the agreement on trade related aspects of intellectual property rights. This is actually uh, uh, a World Trade Organization agreement. And the reason why it prescribes for minimum really is to make sure that there is fairness. There is fairness and uh, this we will explain in detail uh, next week when we'll be looking at unfair competition. But briefly, so that you appreciate why it is important to indicate or provide for minimum protection, an applicant, once he has made an application and there is a grant of patent, where there are countries that give different durations of protection, say country A 
protects an applicant or a patentee for 10 years. And country B protects that very same, same applicant for say 20 years. What then happens here is that the country that has protected the applicant for fewer years will immediately exploit the patentee's invention immediately after 10 years without his authority because his patent really has expired uh, has expired and as such he cannot enforce any right meanwhile his right continues to be protected in country b now what would prevent a person from country b from going to country a to exploit it without uh, the permission of of the patentee so that brings in a lot of unfairness to the patentee in as much as if you ask me, it is an advantage to any country to protect for fewer years. There's a time when India, before this agreement, uh, protected patents for only five years. And you see, the fewer years you protect a patent, the better, because then it is then made available to the public faster and uh, for less. Now, inventions, for which patent is granted uh, come from all fields of technology. And when we say all fields of technology, that's really what we mean. Whether it is in the electronics, engineering, in the built environment, in auto, uh, automotives, in biotech, et cetera, et cetera, all fields of technology. Now, it's important that a, a patent meets certain uh, thresholds. And the person who determines that an invention has met a certain threshold is usually referred to as the person having ordinary skill in the arts in the world of patent. And for you to remember it easily, you can use the acronym for CETA, person having ordinary skill in the arts. He is actually the person that determines whether a patent application satisfies the threshold of patent patentability. And what is this? threshold. The threshold is very, very, very high. One, the invention must be novel. It must meet the criteria of novelty. And novelty means that it is new in the whole world. Meaning that nowhere else in the world has it ever been invented, it's, it's, it's something that has come to the whole world for the first time. And that really is very, very high in terms of threshold. Two, and a very technical one, is that the invention must meet the threshold of inventiveness, inventiveness. And we sometimes prefer using the last part for us to understand. And that is, it must not be obvious, must not be obvious. Let me just give a very simple example here. The office desks that we use today have something very interesting for our cables. And I believe that you can guess what it is. In order for us to have our laptops and our various gadgets that are all wired, and at the same time, we don't want them to mess up the table, there is a very small 
what is called perhaps uh, an invention or an innovation to the, to, to the table that we knew before electronics, which did not have it, and that is a hole. You realize that there is a, there is a, there's, a there, there's a round, of course, there's a hole <laughs> that has been carved out of your table. Now, that was ingenious, if you ask me. That was extremely ingenious. However, in as much as it was ingenious and perhaps actually new, you know, the question would be whether it would meet the second criteria, the second criteria of inventive step. Would we not say that, yes, it is innovative, but isn't it obvious, you know, just carving out a hole? So that then means that that particular innovation cannot meet the threshold of a patent because it is obvious. It is obvious and as such it has, that example that I've given has failed in as much as it is new, but it has failed the second threshold. The third and last threshold is industrial applicability. And this really means that once an invention has been granted, uh, once a patent has been granted uh, to a patentee, the product must be useful, must be useful. Sometimes this other threshold is also referred to as usefulness of the invention, usefulness to the industry or usefulness to agriculture. So if there is a new invention that has met the inventive step or the threshold of the inventive step, and yet it is not useful to the industry, then, it will not meet the threshold of, of a patent simply because it is not useful. And in most countries, this usefulness usually also includes usefulness in agriculture. Now, Industrial applicability might appear very simple, but it also poses a few problems in that, how can we determine that something is of industrial applicability? What is it that distinguishes industrial applicability or usefulness in industry from using a good invention uh, for personal means. If you refer to a document uh, from WIPO that has given the details of this particular uh, threshold, and in particular paragraph six, there is a very nice example and I hope that it will be understood. And this is the example of an invention in the form of an, a contraceptive that has got a chemical. Now, that kind of invention of course, by the time was new and was not obvious. However, the applicability of that particular invention was judged to be of personal use because 
it is something that is just used by a lady who requires uh, such uh, a contraceptive application and as such it that invention could not be granted uh, a patent simply because it failed in the third threshold of industrial applicability. Now, it is important that an application be made by a patent, by, by, by an inventor, okay? And this application is usually in the form of what in the patent world we refer to as patent draft, patent draft. Now, what does a patent draft, uh, what is it composed of? A patent draft is composed of the title of the, inven of the invention. Title is also a name. You know, there must be a name that an applicant has given to his invention. And be warned that it's usually not the name that we usually, that we know. We usually get products that have a very friendly term. Say we, say a car. A car is an invention. But when it comes to title on the patent draft, the title would usually not be car. Car is just for the consumer. The title would perhaps be something like an automotive. Okay, so that title is usually a technical, uh, technical term of the invention. And then there has to be a brief statement of the technical field uh, of the invention given by the applicant for the consumption of the patent office. Then a background and a description. A background here simply means that the inventor can give a background in that particular field. Perhaps it may not necessarily be a new invention, or rather we say today everything has been invented ideally, but there can be innovation. So there could be several other similar devices or similar products. But the inventor here indicates that in as much as there are similar products in giving the background, the particular invention that he intends to patent is different in a few words. Thereafter, it's important to now again, this is technical to have drawings or plans uh, for a better description of the invention. And these are usually in the form of engineering drawings if uh, it's possible. Uh, where it is not possible, then of course, uh, like for example, in the biological sciences world, uh, you know, you can remember those drawings that uh, are in biology. So such, such a drawing can also be a representation for the purposes of a, of a patent draft. In addition to what is called a deposit of a particular microorganism. You know, even micro, we did indicate earlier that patent is given in all fields of technology. So when there is a microorganism, that microorganism is deposited, uh, but a drawing nevertheless uh, is presented in the form of a patent draft. And then there are claims. Now, the claims here really are tied to the second threshold that we talked about, the inventive step. Claim is what brings out the inventive step of an invention. This is where patentee now addresses what exactly is it that is new about the invention that he has uh, 
that, that he intends to, to patent the invention that he has invented. Now, the above patent draft and the composition of the patent draft hinges on the principle of disclosure. Hinges on the principle of disclosure, and this is what disclosure is in a moment. Now, there you are. Uh, we have an example of a drawing. So it's usually a, an engineering drawing, depending on what it is that is being invented and what it is that has been invented and what it is that the patentee intends to patent. This particular one is an example of a drawing of a, of a door knob. Okay, so disclosure. Disclosure is a principle that has to be understood in context. In the patent world, it is a must for the patentee to exchange his, to exchange information about his, his invention in return for a grant of a patent. So really, it's not an option. It's an obligation on, on his part. And the reason why it is important to disclose is that once there is a disclosure and a patent ultimately expires, we had indicated that a patent expires after 20 years, then it would be possible for other researchers and other inventors to take that invention to the next level because they have access or they can access the, uh, the, the information from the patent office. Disclosure here is something that must be guarded because inventors by nature are usually very excited about their inventions. <clears throat> and as such, when such an inventor comes to an IP lawyer for a patent draft, for example, usually the first thing that we ask is whether the inventor has talked to anyone about the invention. And if he has not talked to anyone, and it is impossible to really put together an invention uh, as an individual, then usually in practice there is uh, an NDA, of course, I'm diverging a bit here, uh, a non-disclosure agreement that is signed so that whoever shares with the inventor is sworn to secrecy because of the next point. Should that information leak out there, there are two things that can happen. One is that someone can run with that invention and file it fast. And that's something that we will be seeing in a moment. But two, in most countries, once information is already in the hands of the public, which is, you know, termed as being in the public domain, then in most countries, such an invention would not be, uh, be patented, would not be patented. And as such, it is important to guard uh, the invention uh, and only to disclose it when necessary. Otherwise, once it is in the public domain, in most countries, uh, such an invention would not be patented. But there are certain countries that can still patent despite the invention being in the public domain. So what are inclusions and occlusions? 
exclusions. Uh, when we talk of inclusions, we talk of, of what is patentable. What is patentable? Any product, composition, or an apparatus or process is patentable. So what we are saying here is that there can be an invention in the form of a product, or there can be an invention in the form of a composition, like for example, a chemical that is used for lubricating a product like a door lock. Or there can also be an invention which takes the form of a machine that is used for making the product. In this case, we've given an example of a door lock. Or there can also be an invention by way of a process, and that is a method of making the door locks. So whether it is a product, a composition, an apparatus, or a process, all these are patentable. All these are inclusions. Now, it is also possible to have an improvement on an existing invention. And this really is what is more reasonable and more popular today. 90% in fact of patents that are given today are improvements of existing patents. If you take, for example, uh, the years of using what we nowadays refer to as a mobile, mobile phone, you know, Say, even if we are not to go too far, say if we go as far as 19, perhaps 80, 1980, if you are to look at a phone that was used in 1980 and the smartphone that we use today, you realize that the, there is a great difference, but the invention itself was invented in the 19th century okay so the phone was invented but has gone through constant innovation so every innovation of an existing invention in itself can also be uh be patentable what are non-patentable inventions and these are exclusions of course, these vary from country to country. But in most countries, I've of course given a Kenyan example. Uh, in most countries, plant varieties will not be patentable. And this we will actually cover, we will cover plant varieties as a module uh, on its own next week. Then uh, inventions contrary to public order, morality and public health, safety, ETC will also uh, not be patented in most countries. Uh, and we say most countries again here because different, because patent law is territorial and each national, each country uh, can have different laws for protecting uh, uh, inventions in those uh, specific countries. Again, when we look at public order or morality, uh, sometimes we say that morality here again is relative because an invention that can be perceived as immoral in Kenya may not be perceived as such in another country. So ultimately, it is left to the national uh, legislations and the national offices to determine what exactly is moral, what is immoral uh, 
and the extent of of uh, of uh, of what of, of determining what is patentable. Of course, there are other examples like uh, mathematical formula. You know, uh, cannot be cannot be patented. Computer programs cannot be patented, of course, but are covered in a different regime of intellectual. Okay, so how does one obtain a patent? So once an invention is patentable, patent draft is filed for examination, and the same is examined by uh, the patent office and the individual that examines such a draft is called a patent examiner, and he will look out for what we have discussed, the threshold we look is the foresitter, remember? So he will look at the novelty, he will look at the inventive step uh, in industrial applicability. And once he is satisfied, then he will proceed to, to grant a patent. Now, it can be possible that there can be more than one applications which claim the same invention. And as such, and for many reasons, for very many reasons, and one of the reasons I had hinted in, during our earlier discussion on disclosure, okay? So you, and this is something that we usually see something that is very common again amongst inventors. Inventors are too excited and when they're excited, they go out there and they shout about what they have invented. Uh, an example in history is, uh, you know, the person that, uh, uh, that we, we, we remember uh, discovered density, uh, uh, who shouted Eureka, you know, and ran from the bathroom and was out there uh, uh, very, very excited uh, because he had discovered it while he was in the bathtub. And he seemed to have been very, very excited about the discovery, so excited that he didn't realize that he stepped out of the, the bathroom uh, without uh, covering up until he realized that people were excited about other things. So it is something that really is, uh, is very much a common trait among inventors. So when an inventor goes out there and talks about his invention, there is someone else who might not be as, can we say, as foolish as he is, and such a person can run and file that invention before, before, the, before him. So that person who goes and files before the other person is the person that will have priority over that invention. And that is what in patenting is first to file uh, rule. What are the rights, enforcement of patent rights? Uh, a patent is an intangible property. And as such, since it is an intangible property, the owner can deal with it in the exact manner that the owner of a tangible property uh, can deal with his property. If you have a car and you own a car, you can sell it or you can hire it out uh, for a price. And as such, uh, the same, same thing with a patent holder. The only difference here is that his patent cannot, his, in, his property cannot be seen. And as such, uh, 
uh, we sometimes do not understand or do not appreciate that even this is property. It is just in classification of property, it is classified as an intangible personal property. And as such, such an owner, a patentee, has the right to assign uh, or to license. And he has exclusive rights to also exclude all others within the territory uh, where the patent has been granted uh, from dealing with that particular uh, patent. So he can, from dealing with it by way of making, using, selling, offering for sale or importation uh, of the invention. How does he enforce his rights and what are the remedies for infringement? Again, uh, since he has exclusive rights to his intellectual property by way of patent, we say that anyone going against those rights infringes on those rights. So patent can only be enforced within the territory where it has been protected because of the territorial nature of the patent. So if, and this is important, if, if, if one, has an invention in a country or in any country and has not protected that patent and someone else runs away with it, it becomes impossible for him to enforce his rights. So it is a must for such a person to protect his invention within, that, within a country or in any country where he wishes to be protected if he if 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 his if if he doesn't get a patent if he doesn't get an invention patented in a particular country then it is impossible for him to enforce uh, to enforce those rights the remedies for infringement uh, are usually civil uh, and those can be in the form of what are called uh, temporary injunctions or interlocutory injunctions uh, that one obtains from the court and serves on the party that has gone against his rights, or can be in the form of a final judgment in a, the form of a final in, injunction. Uh, at the same time, uh, A party can also apply for damages or account of profits or even order for what is called delivery up of, of, uh, of the products that have been produced using his invention or using his granted patent without his permission. So the same, a court can actually order for the same to be delivered up and uh, destroyed. A duration of a patent, again, is 20 years. Uh, however, there's usually an annual maintenance fee until the expiry. So every year it is a must for a patent owner to maintain uh, his patent and this is very very important because if he does not then the patent actually lapses and when a patent lapses it is very possible for another person to make an application for that patent to be uh, compulsorily licensed uh, to him. And this brings us to the next point, uh, compulsory licensing. These are exceptions to patent rights. 
So a compulsory license is a lawful manner in which a person who does not own that patent is licensed to work a patent. Work here again is in patent language simply means to exploit, okay? To exploit. We also say working of a patent. So working of a patent is, ex is exploitation of a patent, is monetization of that patent. It's commercializing that patent. Uh, it's, 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 it's a requirement that once you're given a patent, you go out there and commercialize it. So the owner is usually equitably compensated uh, where such a compulsory license has been given. And a compulsory license, of course, here, is given by the government. It's only the government that can give a compulsory license. Uh, and of course, where the invention is deemed essential, then it is a must that uh, uh, the the patentee be approached uh, through a very procedural and very fair manner and he's compensated. For example, where there are essential medicines. An example here is, if you can remember, the, uh, the compulsory license that, uh, that was granted in South Africa for the production of antiretroviral uh, uh, antiretrovirals for uh, for use among uh, patients that uh, had AIDS and HIV. So initially, the antiretrovirals were very expensive because of patents. But South Africa decided that what was more important was the citizens, and as such. South Africa went ahead and granted compulsory license uh, for the public good. Now, trade secrets have been indicated in your, in your module under patent, but it is actually an intellectual property in its own right. Uh, one, it does not need registration. And uh, it's the duration of protection of uh, trade secret, unlike patents, is really in perpetuity, okay? In perpetuity, uh, as long as that secret can be kept tight. And of course, a very popular example is the, the secret to the, the formula for Coca-Cola. Uh, but the reason why they have brought in trade secret here under patent is because it is very possible for the, for the patentee to be advised to keep a certain know-how to himself so that he can be ahead of competition. Meaning that given that he's going to disclose his... Uh, invention to the patent office in exchange of a patent. And given that really around that time, anyone can actually access it and can infringe on his patent, that is one. And two, upon expiry, then that information will be available to the public. Now what happens is that even if it is available to the public and it falls into the hands of someone who can come up with this, a similar invention, the original patentee, given that he has kept a secret or a, a know-how to himself, will still have an advantage, okay? Will still have an advantage over the other person who just goes there, does what we call reverse engineering, uses the information, and after using that information, uh, attempts to put together uh, a certain product. So that know-how, and I believe that is the reason why it has been indicated under 
and a, and, a, and, a, and a patent in your module is 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 something that is allowed uh, for the patentee to keep to himself. He can keep to himself that uh, that know-how so that he is ahead uh, always, so that he's always ahead of competition. Okay. You can see it's three. Uh, Sarah, do we take a break? Um, I think we can proceed because we are a little uh, over the time. Okay. So we can proceed with this one and then take a break uh, after. Oh. oh, okay, thank you. So next is uh, copyright. And uh, copyright here, perhaps as opposed to patent, uh, seems to be more popular, seems to be more popular. And yes, it is very popular. It is the most researched uh, because we easily relate. Most of us easily relate, easily relate with uh, uh, with copyright. Uh, in terms of classification, while patent is an industrial property, copyright here is copyright. In classification of patents, there are two classifications, copyright and industrial property. So patent falls under industrial property and copyright then remains on its own in the class of intellectual property. Let's look at what we have here. Now, copyright, of course, deals with uh, art, literature, or music, or sometimes we say the artistic literary and uh, music music world but again it can also deal with other work that is somehow related to the the basic uh, parts you know the basic uh, scope of of, of, of copyright and these are derivative works, derivative works uh, that are derived by way of information or ideas uh, that control how the work is, is used. We also refer to it as a primary right. We also refer to it as a primary right because it occupies the highest apex of creativity, the highest apex. We can say it is the cathedral. It is the cathedral uh, of creativity. It is the very primary, very fundamental, uh, very, very fundamental uh, step of creativity. Uh, in the arts. It protects, it protects the expression of an idea. And I think this is also problematic. Many a times we talk of having ideas. And before you know it, you talk to somebody about your idea. And before you know it, the person takes your idea and converts that idea in an expressed form. And then you wake up one day and you say that somebody has run away with your idea. In copyright, one cannot have a right to their idea until they have expressed that idea. Now, what do we mean? If you have an idea of a song, it will just remain that, an idea, 
until you either sing that song and record it, or you reduce it into a notation form that can easily be read. Copyright also provides economic incentive to the creator, meaning that just like any other property, just like any other property, it can also be monetized. It can also be monetized. So some works covered by copyright are literary works such as novels, poems and plays, uh, musical compositions, choreography, you know, dance moves, uh, artistic works such as painting, uh, drawings, uh, photographs, uh, and sculptures. But of course, uh, photographs also occupy a different set of uh, rights uh, because then in photography, the photographer uses a device to take a photo. Nevertheless, the photographer behind the camera will own the copyright to the photograph that he takes. Now let me just give an illustration here. Uh, if all of you colleagues who are preparing for this particular exam were to take my photo right now, the photo will be of one person but each one of you will have a copyright to the photo that you have taken. Uh, and so it, it, it occupies a, a very, uh, very interesting place within the artistic world. Then of course, sculptures, architecture, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, remember when we talked of computer programs not being Patentable for computer programs are not patentable, but they can be copyrightable. And so they are protected uh, under copyright. Now, when we talk of deriv derivative works, we talk of uh, adaptations or translations of, 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 of certain works like where there's an English novel, for example, and one wants to translate that English novel to, uh, to Kiswahili, that translated, that translated uh, novel would actually be having, uh, would, would give the translator uh, a kind of a right, but it does not mean that, that the novel has been translated or the translated version ceases to be part of the copyright of the original English novel, okay? But it also covers, it also covers uh, such derivative works, meaning that the person who translates that novel himself can also have a copyright to the translation to the translation. Same as compilation. Uh, compilation again here is interesting because one compiles different, perhaps original items in a creative manner and then claims that as a copyright and it is acceptable. Like an encyclopedia is a compilation uh, of, of, of several perhaps uh, copyrightable, copyrightable works, but the person who comes and then compiles them in a creative manner then can then have uh, uh, a right to the derivative work in copyright. One interesting thing about uh, copyright when it comes to to, to protection is that it is automatic upon creation. It is automatic upon creation. As long as the work is original. So in copyright, we look at originality. In patenting, we look at those thresholds of novelty, industrial inventive step, and 
industrial applicability. In copyright, we look at originality. So as long as work is original, the moment that work has been created, the moment you are done with creation of that work, that work becomes copyrightable automatically and immediately. Let me give a simple example. I know this might not, this, yes. Assuming that wherever you are, you're, you're jotting down some notes. Of course, it is impossible for you to, 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 to write verbatim what it is that I am uh, lecturing at the moment. So you could perhaps be listening to me and then reducing whatever it is that you're listening to in your own way so that you can later on go through your short notes and those short notes will then help you remember what it is that we have discussed today. Now, those short notes that you are writing, okay, are copyrightable the moment you finish with that sentence. The moment you finish with the first sentence, that becomes copyrightable automatically. However, there are certain regimes where copyright is, 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 is registered, and we shall look uh, at that in a moment. But generally, in as much as copyright is automatic upon creation, it is nevertheless important to have that original work witnessed by another person and dated, and dated. And dated. Usually lawyers are very good at this. Uh, they can witness uh, the original work uh, and date it for the purposes of uh, the possibility of bringing it as proof where an infringement occurs. It is also a good idea, where possible, to have that copy, uh, to have that work registered, to register the copyright. And I'm sure that sign is a very common sign for copyright. And the document, and also to document details of works where there are more than one author. So when you have two authors or three authors, or in music, you know, the younger people use the term collabo, okay? When, 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 when there are several artists who come together and collaborate in a particular work, it is important to, doc to, document, to document the exact details and the exact extent of the collaboration of each of those authors. And this would actually be very important, uh, especially when it now comes to matters uh, coming up with agreements on commercializing. You do realize there are some artists that are very popular and there are artists that just want them to appear, okay? So if they appear for two seconds or for one minute, of course, it would also be important to record that so that when it comes to now the money matters, there is no push and pull. And this really is also an important aspect for mediators. Uh, to be aware of. So what are the rights of a copyright holder? There are two main rights. One is moral rights. And these ones usually just highlight the emotive part, the personal link that exists between the author and the work that he has done. And we shall look at that in a moment. And then there are economic rights, and these ones allow the owner to monetize, okay, to make money. Again, it is property like any other property. And so they are, they are his economic rights for him to make money by uh, commercializing uh, his work, commercializing his work.
moral rights are where a person that uses the work of a copyright owner is expected to acknowledge, okay, to attribute uh, the work or the part of work that one has taken from the author for him to attribute it. And this is usually very popular in the academic world where you write a dissertation or you write a project. And uh, when you do that, you do your research and you take, so, you know, you, you refer to several sources. And those sources that you refer to are sources that have, probably, that have copyright. And if they have copyright, then you acknowledge, you attribute. It is also known as paternity right. And <clears throat> of course, you know, in today's world, the term paternity sometimes might appear to be leaving out uh, maternity. So it should be understood in the same breath, paternity or maternity, it's ideally meaning that you can link, you can link the work to the, to the original owner. Today, because of being sensitive, we then use the term attribution or acknowledgement more than paternity as it was used in the ban convention. Then there is also right of integrity. Right of integrity here simply means that the owner has the right of his work being used in such a manner that does not either embarrass him or distort that work uh, in a manner that brings ridicule, in a manner that brings ridicule to the author. Then there are economic rights. And here is where we use the term uh, bundle rights of the author. And these are exclusive to the author exclusive in that he is the one who decides who can copy or reproduce the work, meaning that he is the one to copy or reproduce the work or gives authority to another person to do the same. So he, 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 he excludes others from doing this, from copying, publishing, uh, performing, etc., uh, etc., et or he also authorizes them to do that because he is the one who has those bundle of of rights. And of course, of interest is he can also rent articles. He has the exclusive rights to rent articles and distribute them under the WIPO Copyright Treaty. Okay, acquisition, how does one acquire, uh, how does one acquire copyright? Just like patent, there are laws for acquisition, but at the same time as we had indicated, acquisition is automatic, okay? Because we indicated that copyright is automatic upon, uh, upon creation. But this is seen in the Ban Convention and it is also seen in the Ban Convention countries. It's also seen in the Ban Convention countries. Now, where there are national laws for registration of copyright, then a citizen can actually acquire copyright by way of registration 
as long as that work is fixed. Now fixed here simply means that the work must be written down or recorded or recorded. And this, when we will be looking at the module on traditional uh, cultural expressions, it is something that will be a subject for discussion uh, because in cultural, in folklore, in most communities, there's a lot of uh, music, there's a lot of storytelling that is oral and not reduced uh, down in writing or recorded. Now in civil law countries and ban convention countries, again, no registration really is required. And again, there is no need uh, for the work to be reduced in writing. So such countries, uh, civil law countries, you know, countries like France, for example, is a civil law country. Uh, Vienna is a civil law country. Uh, th in those countries, uh, it is not a requirement that a work must be fixed in order for it to be acquired. But in common law countries like ours, like Kenya, uh, proof is required and as such, the, the work to be registered must be in fixed form in order for it to be, uh, to be, to, to be placed as evidence should their need arise. Now, again, uh, transfer here is to be understood within the context of exclusive rights. One can transfer his rights in the property because it is property. So this can be partial, partial transfer, meaning that a, there can be a condition to it or by way of, you know, of licensing, you know, or it can be full transfer by way of selling uh, the rights altogether. It can be for a limited duration, meaning that an author can transfer his rights for maybe 20 years, and yet the duration here is longer. At the same time, it can also be for the complete duration. And the complete duration, of course, is longer. We will see it uh, in a moment. Uh, and it can also be transferred to one or several parties and can be either restricted within a territory or uh, can be transferred to the whole world. So copyright protection. We had indicated that patent is protected for 20 years minimum. For copyright, the minimum duration that is provided in the Ban Convention and TRIPS is the lifetime of the author plus 50 years. In other words, as long as the author is alive, his patent follows him to the grave. But it continues on once he is in the grave for another 50 years. And this is minimum that uh, the Ban Convention and TRIPS uh, has provided. This can be more, but cannot be less. It cannot be less than lifetime plus, it cannot be less than 50 years, but it can be more. Uh, we have several countries that uh, have increased it to 70 years, like the European Union and Korea, Nigeria, US, etc. Then we have other countries that have, in, have doubled it, like Mexico. It's lifetime plus 100 years. Uh, we have Cote, Cote d'Ivoire that uh, 
is just shy of one year uh, to 100, and that is 99 months. So what we are saying here is that it outlives the author. So the author continues to control through his heirs, through his heirs that he has left behind for <clears throat> the duration that has indicated has been indicated there, minimum being 50 years. So can you guess who was the highest paid dead celebrity in 2018? That is someone who was still being paid, okay, was still being paid way after he died. Okay, perhaps your guess is, is right. And yes, is none other than Michael Jackson, uh, who was the highest paid dead celebrity in 2018, raking in a whopping US dollar 400 million uh, for his work. Limitations and exceptions. Now, where work is not fixed, uh, then in certain nationalities, that work in certain countries, as we have seen earlier, uh, that work will not be will not be copyrighted. Now, in ban countries, we have indicated uh, in ban convention countries, it is not a must for the work to be expressed. Fixed simply means expressed, uh, you know, published and all that. Uh, so. The same also applies to civil law countries. Now, where legal circumstances provide that no authorization is required from, from owner, again, this is something that is, 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 is very common. It is very possible for us to access work under free uses where no authorization and no compensation is required. And it is also possible for us to uh, access uh, by way of non-voluntary licenses. Under non-voluntary licenses, usually this is seen under the uh, uh, is, is, is seen under the Marrakesh Treaty, where there is a humanitarian uh, approach to accessing of copyright materials without seeking the authorization of the owner, but where a small compensation uh, is nevertheless paid. And this is seen, uh, especially where there is technology for people who are blind uh, or physically challenged in one way or the other. Enforcement of copyright. Again, this is uh, by way of orders that we get from court, uh, conservatory uh, orders or provisional measures. There are also civil remedies like damages uh, and account, uh, accounting for, profit, for profits uh, and unlike industrial, unlike patent or industrial property, in copyright, there are, there are also criminal sanctions. That's why we talk of theft of copyright. Of course, on the streets, we use the word piracy, okay? A piracy, piracy is just theft. So it is just theft and it's criminal because you are stealing someone's property without their permission and you're using that property without any intentions of ever returning it forever in the, informing uh, the author. So that then becomes criminal. Then there are border inspections uh, where there are goods that come that, that, that either, you know, come from, from one country into our country and vice versa. Because again, you know, where there are copyrighted uh, materials that have, that, that, that have been, can I continue using the word pirated? such materials can be exported 
So when they are exported and they pass through a certain border, then the state has the obligation to stop such, uh, such materials from leaving the country or because we, we are also members of, of international conventions for us to also stop infringing copies that are being imported into, into our country at the borders. So the same are usually uh, seized uh, by, 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 by customs officials. Then there are other measures and remedies and sanctions against abuses in, res in, res in respect of uh, technical uh, means. Okay. Sarah, I don't know if we could invite some questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, William, for taking us through um, the patent and the copyright. Um, I'll just uh, identify some of the questions that have come through. Uh, we have one question, uh, though you haven't touched on the trademark, but you will be looking at this later. So probably come later. Um, there's a question uh, regarding uh, use of knowledge from a patent from a patent to create a new patent, do I owe the previous patent holder anything? If I use knowledge from a patent to create a new patent, do I owe the previous patent holder anything? Um, a question on copyright uh, asks, explain the copyright issues as applying to social media. explain copyright issues as applying to social media. On uh, copyright uh, asks, how do we ascertain originality and a copyright law when there can hardly be any work independent of another? How do we ascertain originality and a copyright law when there can hardly be any work independent of another. Perhaps you could take those three kindly. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, perhaps we can begin with the first question. When you say that you have obtained knowledge of a patent, it simply then means it can mean two things, first of all. Eh? One, there is knowledge and there is information that is readily available. That is readily available at the patent offices for patents that have expired, okay? So where such knowledge is from patents that have expired, then you obviously owe the patentee nothing because the knowledge is now free for the public to use without his authorization. However, where that patent has not expired, the moment you use his knowledge, you will already have infringed on his rights. So it is important that if you want to use that knowledge, you then enter into an arrangement, into a license arrangement, so that he can then allow you to use that knowledge. And it is something that is very, very common. I know we are so restricted because we want to 
uh, restrict ourselves to the syllabus uh, to, and, and to the outline that you will be doing. But there is something called patent pooling, okay? There's something called patent pooling, where different inventors actually pool their patents together. And this is something that they do because they've realized that entering into licensing of patent, entering into licensing arrangements in patenting is very, very costly. Very, very costly. Uh, and as such, it is better to patent pool. So uh, I hope I have answered you. So if, 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 if that information is on a patent that has expired, then you don't owe the patent, the original patent on anything, but where it has not expired, then it is a must that uh, you, uh, you seek permission. Now, uh, on copyright and social media, I think the same can be approached in two ways. Eh? If you remember from our discussion, uh, there are exceptions. There are exceptions uh, to copyright. And if you go by way of exceptions to copyright, uh, and I know this is really not a very specific question. If you go by way of exceptions, then you wouldn't really say that uh, you are infringing uh, on copyright uh, by using social media. Uh, I wish this question was more specific because I am refraining myself from reading into into this question. Uh, because if I then read into it, then I would then say that we obtain so much on social media. I don't know whether I would be doing justice by reading into somebody's question. And there are times when you find that someone has posted something that Actually, maybe this is where the question is, 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 is going. Uh, someone has posted, posted something belonging to another person uh, for consumption on social media. And what that actually entails, and there are several case law here, is that if you post something without the authority or without attribution, but you're posting it in such a way that you want the rest of the world to take it as yours, then at that point in time, you will actually have been free on the copyright of the original owner. But again, it depends on whether it is free access or otherwise. If it is something that is free access, then you will not have uh, infringed on any copyright on social media. So it can go two ways. It is very possible to infringe and there's so many times when people have actually been sued uh, for using works on social media uh, that uh, do not belong to them. Now the, the third question, could you just repeat it once again, please, sir? Okay. Um, the third question was, how do we ascertain when uh, there can hardly do we ascertain originality and the copyright law when there can hardly be any independent work of another? Ah, is, okay. Is okay. Now, of course, uh, yes, it is, it, it, is, it is clearer, it is clearer. And, uh, you know, there are many times when, even in the music world, you know, you could sit somewhere and, uh, uh, you know, listen to 
some music and fine it would be music from a particular artist but at the back of your head you kind of ask yourself where have i heard that tune where have i heard that tune uh, it is very possible it is very very possible to ascertain originality because if there is a combination that is available to that is available for use say let's give the example of music okay music has melodies it has got seven notes and a combination of any of those notes in as much as the same might appear to have been used in another combination elsewhere if there is an original manner in which in music one has combined the same notes then it would be possible to ascertain originality but this question is important because it is not as easy when it comes to the world of computer programs and there is i think a case called a science uh, science case in japan okay where two software companies that produced software for doing the same thing but using algorithms that were available to both of them okay but one used you know algorithms the, a combination of algorithms is 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 available to anyone is available to anyone uh, for use and in as much as the computer programs ended up doing the same thing the first person who came up with that program ended up suing the second person who used uh you know his own set of computer uh algorithms to come up with the same thing and the court actually indicated that there was no originality uh, uh, in using a set of uh, computer algorithms that are available for use by computer uh, programmers so it's 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 again just like the first just like the second question, it can go either way. It is very possible where there is a set like in computer programs, it's very possible for one to actually ascertain whether uh, work is, is, uh, is original uh, or otherwise. And you know, it is, it, it is very popular even in apps. You realize that there are so many apps. One of the examples is, for example, the apps that we use for mobile uh, mobile loans yeah they just come in different words but what do they do they do the same thing you want to to borrow money you choose which app you want to use but they end up doing the same thing but with some slight changes so it is impossible for the very first person who came up with such a program to say that now uh his his, his copyright is being is being infringed because uh, the algorithms are there for use uh, for the same application. Um, okay. Sarah? Uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, William, for those. Uh, we'll be able to have uh, some more questions when we resume after the break. Uh, but just before our short break, I'll invite uh, Wangari uh, to be able to make some comments and then she'll be able to ask uh, Emily to come on right after, us, after her. Wangari? Hello everyone and uh, I'm delighted to be part of this session today. I would like to thank uh, our Mwalimu for today, that is uh, uh, William Agan, and uh, uh, thank him most of all because um, he's journeying together with a team of us who, uh, who are 
in the process of uh, our journey as uh, intellectual property dispute resolution professionals. So colleagues, uh, we are looking forward to also the next session, which will be held on the September uh, 3rd, uh, at the same time at 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Nairobi time. Um, today's session is on uh, August 27th at uh, uh, 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. And the reason why this topic is actually pertinent to us as professional mediators is because we know that the innovation space is a game changer. And it being a game changer, then as professionals, we need to be able to understand the intricacies of the intellectual property so that we can be able or probably be able to serve um, other uh, persons who are in need of our services much better. I also welcome colleagues who have joined us from other regions who are also taking uh, part in this course. Please feel at home and also the other colleagues who are from Kenya who uh, are also uh, joining us here and they may not be taking the course. Please feel um, at home and as was Liana have team we are looking forward to you being able to join us at um, other sessions. So in case you have any questions or queries uh, in the email you received you are able to send an email to us Liana Hub and we can share more information that can be able to help you to be able to engage if you're a mediator and if you're not also there are other ways that you can be able to engage together. So Mediator Sarah Akel, thank you and uh, back to you kindly. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, Mediator Sarah, are we taking the break? We're taking the break now. So before we take the break, Emily, you can kindly say hello to us. Uh, Emily from the American Konamoy, who's also on the call. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Emily. Thank you, Wangari. Thank you, Sarah, for uh, organizing this session. Um, thank you, William, again, for a very informative session. Uh, we are learning a lot on intellectual property. Um, Emily Okeo from the American Kona Moi, and uh, we uh, from the Kona, especially our Facebook uh, participants, we log on to the Thursday session to learn more on topics under the mediation and uh, dispute resolution area. And uh, we are learning a lot. Our viewers who are general, our participants, sorry, who are mainly of the youth, um, are learning a lot quite from this and we are looking forward to very many more sessions uh, especially on Thursday so thank you very much okay thank you very, very much Emily I know we have questions that are on the chat and as uh, Sarah has indicated we will be taking a two minutes break so that at least you can be able to refill your glass um, uh, with water and then uh, get back Sarah, back to you. You can give us the time to come back. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Okay, colleagues, it's 10 minutes to four. Let's be back five minutes to four. So uh, kindly, uh, William again, you'll look it through the questions and then after the break, you will be able to respond too quickly to the questions in the chat as you take us to the next topic. So let's take a water break and be back at five minutes to four. Thank you.
Okay, uh, Mwalimu William again, are you back and ready to go? Sarah, we had taken the five minute break, so now we are ready to be able to continue. And we can have our Mwalimu William again. Yes, thank you. Yes, uh, I hope you had a good water break. <laughs> yes, I did. Thank you. You did? You had a good water break. Okay, thank you. Yes, the, uh, it was a good opportunity for uh, being able to now connect with the next part of the discussion. We, had a, we have a couple of questions around the chat. And we wanted to request if you could kindly just browse through them uh, quickly just before we start the next part. And so that we are still able to uh, close in, in time. So, Malimu, you're able, you're looking through the chat, the chat, sorry. Uh, yes, let me just scroll. Yes, yes, yeah, it can kind of just do a quick scroll so that you uh, can uh, merge them. You can merge them, some of them you responded to already. So you can merge them and just do a quick run, then we can now move to the next part. And Sarah, kindly, you proceed then from here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Wangari. Garibu. Okay, I had actually seen one. I'm not seeing, I had seen several, but I'm no longer seeing them. But there's one that I remember from uh, Vishnu, uh, okay. where she indicates that uh, uh, copyright laws are different in different countries, and she uh, brings in the difference between uh, the U.S. copyright, uh, the U.S. copyright uh, laws and the Indian copyright laws, uh, where in the U.S. Uh, it is possible to patent software. Perhaps I can just clarify when we talk of patenting software. Software ideally is a product of computer programs, which are protected under copyright very strictly. However, to answer Vishnu, when the computer program is directly related to the functionality of a patentable product. Then, and only then, would we say that it can be patented. So it is not new to say that elsewhere, computer, you know, software is being patented. I think software can be patented in most countries, as long as they are directly related to the functionality of the product which qualifies to, to be patented, which qualifies to be patented. If not, then it can only be protected under, under copyright laws. For whatever reason, I don't know why from my end, I can only see Vishnu's uh, okay. chart. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Let, let me let me uh, see. Uh, Sarah, you can see the questions so that you can run through. Molimu, kindly. Um, I, I, I do have a few other questions, but perhaps we can proceed and then we can get the questions towards the end. Okay. Okay. So back to Molimu then. Thank you. Okay, Asante. Yeah, we'll attend. So, uh, just uh, uh, through the, the, the patent. Yes, and, uh, and now he will be taking us through the module on uh, related rights and trademarks. And then after that, we'll be able to uh, collect a few more questions for you to be able to go through. Uh, so welcome again, uh, Mr. Gan, and uh, kindly take us through the remaining two modules for today. Thank you. Uh, can you enable me to share? Yes, just in a moment. Uh, 
you can proceed to share. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, just give me a moment. Uh, it's just taking a bit of time to respond. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Uh, welcome once again. We will now be looking at uh, related rights and thereafter uh, trademarks. Now, related rights, uh, even from the terminology itself, from the term itself, uh, is a right that exists because there is a copyright. It is a related, it is a related right to copyright. It is also referred to as a secondary right. Remember, we referred to uh, copyright as primary, uh, or it can also be referred to as a neighboring uh, right. Copyright, on the one hand, being a primary right, protects the author who we said occupies the cathedral place of creation. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> in most instances, the author would rely on another person or organization to have his work uh, expressed in a different way. We can have a composer, for example, of music, but the composer of music would have copyright to the composition of music that he has composed, but when he brings in another person now, a singer or a performer, to sing that song that he has composed, then the singer will now have related rights to the right that the author has, okay? So in this case, if he performs a song from a composition, that performance will be a related right of the performer and he will have uh, the performer's right. You have the performer's right. Where this very person then looks for an organization or a company to produce for him this song and fix it in different ways including digital manner, then that person being a producer will also have a related right to the work that he has produced. Now, if this work then is broadcasted by a broadcasting company, that broadcasting company will also have a right to the broadcasted work. So those secondary, the players or the beneficiaries of these rights also have rights uh, that only vary 
perhaps as seen in the duration, and we shall look at it in the duration of protection, but they too have a right to whatever work that they have, uh, that they have done that is related to the copyrighted, copyrighted work. Again, there are national laws and international laws that protect these beneficiaries. But the extent of these rights, again, varies from one country to another. However, it is important still to note that national laws of countries that are member or signatories to international conventions that provide for protection, that provide for, for, for minimum protection, are not allowed to provide protection that is below the minimum that has been indicated. Some of these international laws, so that we do not uh, have to go through them again, are the Rome Convention of 1961, uh, the TRIPS agreement, by now you should just be using the acronym, the, uh, the Agreement on Trade-Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights, uh, TRIPS agreement, as well as now the WPPT, the WIPO Performance and Phonograms Treaty of 1996. For, for audiovisuals, the Beijing Treaty on Audiovisual Performance uh, 2012. The WPPT grants beneficiaries, uh, beneficiaries of related rights, the rights of reproduction, distribution, uh, rental, or performances fixed in phonograms, as well as moral rights to prevent uh, the an authorized or unreasonable omission of their name. Uh, remember when we <clears throat> discussed what these moral rights are all about, attribution. Okay, so even the beneficiaries of related rights have been given these rights by the WPPT so that the, their paternity right is also uh, protected or the attribution is protected uh, once they have reduced uh, their performances in one way or the other. The Rome Convention, uh, <clears throat> it's, it provides for performers, producers of phonograms and broadcasting organizations, but countries, unlike many other uh, treaties and conventions, for this particular convention, countries had to first legislate local laws before they could uh, uh, access, or rather in law we say that countries must first of all ratify, uh, or domesticate rather, domesticate uh, the, the laws in their own, the international law in their own countries by way of, of legislation. The Beijing Treaty protects and covers now works in, uh, incorporated into audiovisuals, incorporated into audiovisuals. Now the purpose of protection, why then do we need to protect? Uh, sometimes we, you know, we, 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 we may think that since the works that are done by these beneficiaries are secondary and as such, they should not really claim these rights. I think this is where we also go wrong. And for a very long time, uh, this has been a subject. This has been a, a subject of, of several conflicts and several disputes because of that attitude and lack of understanding that they too 
have a stake, but their stake is only different. Now, why then should we protect them? It is very, very obvious that performers and producers of sound recordings add the creative input once approached. It is obvious that people cannot be talented in the same manner. Yes, there are few artists who can compose, okay, what sometimes we say they can write songs, they can also produce songs, and they also perform. So you find that in a single artist, and it is very rare, the single artist will do all those. But not everybody can do that. So to get someone who can now add the creativity, that person needs one to be recognized because of that input that he has added. Uh, and two, to be given that right. They also bring in technical resources, technical resources. Now, this is not an investment that every artist uh, has. In fact, very many artists start off with no money, but they bring on board the talent and these beneficiaries of related rights bring in the technical resources because they've invested. They've invested in these technical resources. They also bring in financial resources uh, that is needed to bring the recording to, to the public. They, for them, this is, they, they also invest and as such, uh, their input is critical. Broadcasting organizations have also justified interest in protecting their technical and organizational skills uh, in programs from acts of theft. Uh, and, and so, you know, they too need, uh, need to be protected. Now, when it comes to protection of these rights, and perhaps the reason why they are considered secondary rights, and given as we had discussed earlier, they derive, or rather their rights are directly related to, to, to copyright. We see this in the duration of protection that is lower uh, as compared to the right uh, seen the duration of protection seen in copyright. The Rome Convention, for example, protects uh, different related rights for 20 years from the date when there was there is either the performance or the work has been uh, recorded or the work has been, uh, has been broadcasted 20 years uh, across the board. So whether it is uh, performed, uh, produced or broadcasted. Uh, TRIPS, on the other hand, uh, is actually similar to our national laws in Kenya. And I think also very many national laws uh, has given a slightly higher protection for 50 years for performers and producers, but has lowered the duration to 20 years for broadcasting organizations. Uh, of course, as we look at duration, let us always remember that the duration of protection is always for two reasons. One is in order for the beneficiary to benefit from their financial investment or otherwise. Uh, two, so that that work can be available for use to the public without the authority of the uh, 
of the beneficiaries. And that is why there is that cap. Uh, so for both copyright and related rights, uh, unlike, if you remember, unlike trade secrets that has perpetual protection, for these rights, the, there is a cap on the protection and that is as we have just indicated. Now, protection of traditional cultural expressions. I know we will be looking into this uh, in detail, but it is also important here to understand. And uh, it might appear to be debatable, and I'm sure that we will look into it when we are looking at, uh, uh, at uh, traditional, cult uh, traditional cultural expressions as a module because of various uh, reasons touching on communal uh, ownership of traditional cultural expressions and also touching on the manner in which traditional cultural expressions are passed on from one generation to the other. Uh, but we will be looking at it. Uh, as far as uh, we are concerned here, traditional cultural expressions can actually be better, uh, can be better protected given that they are usually not in fixed form. They're usually not in fixed form. So the moment beneficiaries of related rights have made it possible by way of recording, by way of broadcasting, uh, what are just performed orally, then it provides a, a, a protection from this perspective, from this perspective, it provides protection uh, to indigenous uh, uh, cultural or traditional cultural expressions. Uh, it will be interesting next week to, to, to have this discussion in detail. Uh, because again, you know, uh, not all indigenous communities or cultural communities are comfortable with uh, what they feel they own in perpetuity, being subjected, for example, to a form that ideally expires. It will be an interesting discussion that we will have. Now, enforcement of these related rights, again, is very, very similar uh, to uh, enforcement of, of copyright, exactly the same. Uh, and this enforcement is uh, both civil and criminal uh, because it is here where we talk of theft uh, or we talk of, we talk, we talk of, uh, of, of, um, of piracy. Uh, we have to use that word that we use on the streets. So copyright and related rights uh, both are those modes in intellectual property where you also have criminal sanctions. The same uh, is not seen in industrial property. Uh, in industrial property, we only have civil uh, remedies. Okay. Trademarks. Again, trademarks is not something new and uh, has always been expressed in different ways, in different communities, uh, because then it is about really leaving a mark. It is about placing a signature 
of the person that owns certain products and is seen in engravements for example among the indians of course it is also common in persian countries among the babylonians uh, and of course you know uh, it's also seen in several marks for pottery that distinguish such that one would actually distinguish uh, pottery by way of looking at the mark and one would know uh, which pottery came from which place or which pottery uh, came from or originated from which particular uh, person or, 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 uh, or porter. It is indeed a badge, it's a badge of origin. And today we have many, 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 many trademarks. In fact, for us here in Kenya, for example, and I think the whole world, trademarks seem to be more popular uh, even than patents, uh, given the very strict nature of the threshold, of the meeting threshold in patents. Uh, trademarks seem to be very, very popular. Uh, at the same time, trademark, in as much as we are looking at it in isolation or in a compartment for the sake of, uh, of academia, is not an intellectual property that exists on its own. It is an intellectual property that rides on other intellectual property. If there's a product that has been patented, an invention that has been patented, that invention will need a name. That invention will need uh, a, a mark that will distinguish it from other uh, products. So trademark is one intellectual property that does not, uh, cannot be in isolation. It has to be together. And indeed, when you think about it, a product can have a combination of several uh, intellectual properties. If there is an artistic expression uh, that is on a particular uh, product and that artistic expression is in, in the form of a trademark, then we already see that there is a patented product, a copyrighted artistic expression and a trademark uh, belonging to a particular trader. So what then does trademark mean? Of course, it's a word or a, or a design or a combination of these. But again, uh, it can also include numbers. It can include colors, okay? Uh, or it can be a combination. For example, the mobile telef uh, telephone companies in Kenya, if you look at the first digits, if it is Safaricom, and I, for example, begin by my number that begins with 0721, that is the mark for Safaricom and Airtel cannot have a 0721. So numbers can also distinguish, can also be marks, whether registered or otherwise. Uh, trademark can also be in, in, in the form of a texture uh, or, or a scent uh, or a figure. Uh, Coca-Cola, the, the, the Coca-Cola bottle, the, 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 the glass bottle itself is a trademark. Okay, trademarks can also be a 3D. So a trademark can be 2D, two dimension, and can also be three dimension. So this is not really an exhaustive uh, a definition, but 
you know, it uh, brings out the meaning of, of trademark as long as that mark is used to distinguish the goods or services of one person or organization from those of others in the marketplace. Now, when we talk of goods and services, again, I know uh, there is an element of registration that, 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 that has not been provided, and I know that you don't have to do it. But let me just point out and underline goods and services. Because when registering trademark, and this one is just an additional information, when registering trademarks, the the, the classification, the NIS classification that we refer to has several classes of goods and several classes of services. So the definition also points to the technical uh, part of registration of, 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 of trademark. And the registration is then done according to the class, according to the class of goods, according to the class uh, of services, but I know that uh, we are restricted to, uh, we, 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 we don't have to, uh, to go into the details of the technical part of, uh, of registration. Now there can be word marks, there are word marks, figurative marks, hologram marks, uh, sound marks, I think smell, uh, we had indicated texture and color. And again, uh, this makes a lot of sense because when we say that it can be a combination, it can be a combination of most of this uh, that we are seeing. I just want to refer to the old radio. You know, nowadays we hardly listen to the radio, but uh, each radio station, when it came to the time of news, had its own, own unique way of playing some sound. So one would say that, ha, ah, that is Voice of America, or that is uh, KBC, you know, or that is Radio Maisha. So, so, so even that sound, or, you know, uh, when it's nine o'clock, uh, on, when it's 9 p.m. and uh, it's news time, even if you're not in the room, you can easily know from the sound that, ah, that is KTN or that is Citizen. So that also is a, a, a mark that distinguishes by way of sound uh, their services uh, from their competitors. Protection of trademark is secured by registration. Uh, because then under various legislations, that registration provides proof of ownership. And it also makes it easier in case of, makes it easier in case of infringement. However, it is also important to note that it is not a must for a trademark to be registered. Just like copyright, the way we indicate it, it's not a must for copyright to be registered. Trademark also can exist without registration. The difficulty, however, and the reason why one would rather register a trademark is because should someone then use the same mark as the one that has been in the market, it then becomes difficult for the owner to prove and in fact, it is not even considered as an infringement of the rights of the owner, but is regarded as a passing off, which is 
uh, common law technicality that is put in place to protect unregistered marks, unregistered marks. So to prevent that hassle, to prevent that hassle, it's better if you ask me to register a trademark. But that does not mean that one does not have the right to sue for passing off and not for infringement. It's important to uh, take note of the two terminologies. One infringes the right to a trademark owner that is registered, but one passes off where the mark of the owner is not uh, registered. Now, when it comes to the characteristics of the trademark, even from its own definition, it is one that can be used to distinguish, to distinguish. And as such, in order for it to be registered, it must be different from an existing trademark. And it must not be deceptive. It must not be deceptive, meaning that one should not, and it is common in business, especially among products that are very popular among consumers, for another trader to come in and purport to have one that is similar somehow with the motive of deceiving the consumer who will think or who will be misled into believing that that other product, because it has a sign, belongs to that particular uh, trader then of course it should not be contrary to public order or morality. Again, this is uh, very relative uh, because one product, you know, a sign, one sign in Kenya uh, that is considered offensive may not be considered offensive uh, in another country. It should also not be identical or confusingly similar to an existing trademark. Of course, if it is identical, then it definitely means that the motive is, 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 is bad. If it is confusingly similar, again, it means that the person has put in some, has gone through some thought process to come up with something that is different in the estimate of a consumer, but again, the average consumer here would easily confuse it to belong to a trader that the consumer is used to purchasing uh, products from. So it's the average consumer. And the process here that one has to go through in order for the trademark office to ensure that the new mark does not deceive or is not confusingly similar or is distinctive is to go through the process of search, which is an examination that is done by a national office. And 
This can also be done by a regional, a regional office. And it is done by an, an, an examiner. Then there are collective and certification marks. Now, collective marks are marks that are actually used by different traders that deal in certain goods, but have come together and have formed an association of sorts and have agreed to use a particular mark. So the mark here would really not belong to an individual trader, but would belong to the association. So the ownership of that collective mark would vest in the association. Certification marks, on the other hand, are marks that bring out a certain standard. They are marks that bring out a certain standard in that particular uh, field or in that particular trade. Like for example, if one is looking for yarn for the purposes of knitting, then there would be different wool, uh, different, different yarns made of wool from different traders. But because they have achieved a certain standard, they would then have the wool mark certification sign. So anyone looking for quality would look out for this particular sign and would be satisfied that indeed this particular product has, satis has satisfied certain standards, certain set standards uh, that are expected of that particular product. Now, we, we also have well-known marks under the Paris Convention and we also recognize these well-known marks because several national laws have conformed to this requirement. These well-known marks are marks which do not need registration. They are known anyway. And because they do not need registration, sometimes if they are not protected, actually in most of the cases, if they are not protected, then it is very easy for them to be abused in national, uh, in, 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 in countries. Again, trademark is also a territorial, you know, so it's also very much territorial. So here we say that it is territorial because if a mark is not protected in a particular country, then it is very possible for that trader's mark to be misused in that country without any uh, remedies or without any right of enforcement. Now, well-known marks also originate from certain countries. But if we were to use or apply the territoriality or the territorial nature of trademark, and yet they are well known, then it would be unfair. So for them, they enjoy actually, under the Paris Convention, they enjoy that status. You may want to ask them, maybe what then are some of the criteria for well-known marks? Uh, it's a very debatable area because it really then requires 
some very well researched, uh, you know, uh, uh, report on the market. Because you and I may say that McDonald is well known, but perhaps someone in a remote area somewhere may not care about or may not even have heard of McDonald. Uh, so sometimes we then say that the well-knownness of a trademark also depends on the market that consumes that particular product. So McDonald would usually be very popular in most urban, country, urban, urban places, and especially big cities. If you talk of McDonald in Nairobi, people will say, yeah, they, they know McDonald's or, you know, Coca-Cola, or nowadays, you know, uh, Apple computers. So as long as a particular market where such items are uh, consumed are well vast with such products, then, you know, it could be one way of also accepting that such products uh, are well known. Now, we also have domain names. And these, of course, you know, are internet addresses that themselves differentiate one internet address from the other. Uh, and they are commonly used uh, to find websites. Uh, and sometimes domain names may be made up sometimes of a trademark. And in such a case, it may happen that the person who has registered the domain name has done it in bad faith. Uh, and this is very common. You know, people run, they use a certain trademark, they register a domain so that when the trader now wants to go and register that domain, they find that there is a domain that has already been registered. The activity is actually very common. It's commonly known as, as cyber, cyber squatting, cyber squatting. Is it possible to have a single trademark to be used worldwide? The answer is no. Again, trademarks are still very much territorial. Uh, in as much as I know that we are you know, from the syllabus, we are not going into the technicalities of registration, but it is important for us to understand why it's not possible to have a single trademark for the whole country, for the whole world. I had indicated earlier that trademark is territorial and as such, it is protected under the laws of a national under, under the, the laws of a country, under national laws. Or it can also be under regional laws. Uh, in Africa here, for example, we have a repo and there's the Banjul uh, protocol uh, on trademarks. Uh, but each country has its own trademark law that looks into some of the criteria that we have discussed, looks into what it considers uh, moral, for example, looks into what it considers as distinct or what can be, can be registered according to the technology. In Kenya, for example, we don't have, at the Kenya Industrial Property Institute, we do not have the technology to register scent, scent marks we, or sound marks. We don't have. 
and as such, it would be impossible for us as a country to register such, such marks. Uh, so there are those national, national systems. Now, to explain what is usually referred to as a single filing system now that can confuse students to mean that there is a worldwide registration through WIPO is that there is a single filing system under the Madrid system. And the Madrid system here comes in two ways. It comes in by way of single filing using the Madrid agreement, which is administered by WIPO, or the Madrid protocol. Now, what is the difference? And this one I'm deviating, but just to make you understand, uh, because again, the details have not been provided uh, in, the, in the modules. The Madrid agreement, when one is filing, is doing a single filing system, is, is doing a single filing system through WIPO, through the Madrid agreement, the applicant must have successfully registered the mark must have successfully registered the mark in the country of origin. In this case, since this presentation is from Kenya, let's use Kenya, okay? So we must first of all have a certificate of registration and thereafter, and thereafter, using that certificate, file for a single filing system at WIPO for designation to other countries. So what then does WIPO does? WIPO will then looking at the countries that we've designated. When I say designated, there are two terms, country of origin. So country of origin would be, in this case, we are using the example of Kenya. So Kenya is the country of origin where a certificate has been filed a certificate has successfully been processed or registered. Then we file through WIPO and then we designate, we are the ones who designate that we want this particular mark protected in country A, B, C, and D. So those will be designated countries. So what WIPO will do, WIPO will now work, do the work for us and get in touch with the national trademark offices of those individual countries for the purposes of filing the application in those countries. And those countries can either accept or refuse because they have their own national laws that determine the registration of those marks. Then Madrid Protocol, on the other hand, and it's not very difficult. The difference here is under Madrid Protocol, one does not need to have successfully registered a mark in the country of origin. But the filing is still done from the country of origin, okay, to WIPO. And then the same thing, the various countries that one needs protection, the designated countries are indicated in the form, on the form uh, for single filing. So at the end of the day, it is still single filing in that we don't go running from country to country to protect our trademark. We allow WIPO to actually do the work for us. Of course, it is not for free. There is an amount of money that is payable for the administration to WIPO. And there is also now the various fees that we still pay depending on the fees charged by the various countries. So in effect, we then do not do the donkey work we leave WIPO now to do the donkey work for us. 
that is what uh, is referred to as a single filing system uh, through WIPO. Thank you for listening to me. I hope I've not taken so much time so that we can still then take up some questions. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, William, for being able to take us through uh, the second part of today's session, uh, where we were focusing on the related rights and the trademark. Um, I, I do have a few questions which are already uh, down. I can just start by reading out some of the questions and then you can be able to take, uh, it's a combination of what you covered earlier, uh, the patents and the copyright, all the way through to related rights and trademark. Um, is it easier or cheaper to register an international patent under WIPO or through KIPI? Is it a uh, patent under WIPO or through a question? Is, uh, is a trademark registered in India valid in other countries or is a trademark registered in a particular country valid in other countries? Another question is, how do you put value on intellectual property when selling it? How do you put value on intellectual property when selling it? Perhaps you could take those three kindly. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, easier or cheaper to register a patent under PCT or under national law? My take would be, yes, it is easier and cheaper. And it is easier and cheaper in this way. Remember that patent is territorial. And as such, say you want to protect your patent in 100 countries. If you opt for multiple filings, it means that you will need to get in touch with patent agents like myself in all those countries so that your patent is registered in those countries. Now, uh, I, on the other hand, you can still designate those 100 countries to WIPO and allow WIPO to do the running for you. Is it cheaper? I mean, is it easier? Of course, it is easier to do this uh, through, through WIPO. Is it cheaper? I would still say that Yes, it is still cheaper because various countries have different uh, different different uh, different patent 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 agents that charge different fees, and it is usually not very cheap. And yet, when WIPO administers this for you, then it deals directly with the national uh, offices, with the national offices. So I would actually say that yes, it is cheaper and it is easier to register using a single filing system. And in any case, that is the reason why a single filing system is even popular with most, uh, with most uh, uh, patent patent agents. TM in India or in any other country, can it be valid in another country? I think the answer would still go back to the territorial nature of these industrial properties. If a trademark in India is to be valid in another country, there is no option but to go to that country and protect that trademark in that other country. Believe you me, ladies and gentlemen, 
if you don't protect it there, you will not be able to enforce that particular mark. Value on intellectual property. Yes, it is possible to value, and this is a product that is usually done by intellectual property lawyers through what is called intellectual property uh, valuation. In the same way, uh, valuation of, uh, of immovable property is done. You have valuers that are experts in coming to your property, to your land, and giving you a value based on certain variables and parameters. It is also the same with intellectual property assets. They are usually valued and they are valued by intellectual property lawyers that have the product. Usually the product is called, uh, for the purposes of trademarks, it is called brand, uh, brand valuation. And so yes, it is actually possible to uh, value an intellectual property asset uh, because then that is what would inform uh, the person that is selling it uh, separately from the invention itself. Remember that the invention is the product, but the intellectual input is what now belongs to the, the creative, the intellectual property input. And yes, uh, it is valued. It is valued by intellectual property lawyers. It's also another very technical area uh, because then there are several uh, uh, ways of going about it. That uh, is a whole uh, subject on its own. Okay. Uh, and thank you for those. Uh, there's uh, uh, some questions on some uh, current issues. Uh, one of them is that uh, what are the legal and moral issues around patenting the COVID-19 vaccines? What are the legal and moral issues around patenting of COVID-19 uh, vaccines? Then uh, another question is that uh, Apple recently tried to block uh, uh, the pair as a trademark. Is it justified in trying to do this? Apple recently tried to block uh, the pair uh, being used as a trademark. Is it justified in, in doing this? And then uh, the third so, sorry, question sorry, that uh, you so, can- Sorry, Sarah. Uh, you said Apple yes. recently blocked uh, the use of pair as a trademark by the another organization. Pear. The use of the pair, you know that, yeah, the, the, the fruit, uh, how the oh, fruit the looks like. Okay, okay. Yes, 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 yes. Is it an ongoing case? Because I'm not aware of it. Yes, yes, it is. It is an ongoing case? Yes. And then uh, the third question that uh, you could take is uh, how, um, how can SMEs and innovators use uh, intellectual property in their business? How can SMEs and innovators use intellectual property in their business? So you could take those three. Okay, uh, if, we, if, if, if we begin with the first one, I think we actually discussed the answer. Uh, we discussed the answer on the legal and moral issues, uh, which we can actually uh, use in this uh, rather very emotional and very shocking uh, pandemic that we are in, and that is of COVID. 19. Now I will purely, purely answer this from a legal uh, and an intellectual property perspective because I know there is also a lot of conspiracy theories and a lot of politics and a lot of back and forth 
which we I personally cannot authenticate because I'm not uh, privy to all that information. Now, patenting uh, issues around the vaccine, from our study, we indicated that inventions from all all uh, fields of technology can be patented. Vaccines are patented. Penicillin was one of the vaccines that was patented a uh, long time ago. And remember the disclosure issue, whoever goes to, pat to patent the vaccine the vaccine, the vaccine will have to disclose uh, the, the, the formula to the patent office for the same, same reasons that we discussed. Will it at that point in time be immoral to then uh, refuse to part with the patent, that is a non-issue. Remember when we talked about compulsory licensing, it would be ridiculous that people are dying from C19 and there is a company that is minting money from from people. There will be an exclusion, there will be an exception, and it will be possible from where I sit for the government to enter into an agreement with whoever has that, uh, uh, that pattern. to be compensated so that a third party can be given a compulsory license to proceed on, to proceed on uh, with uh, producing the vaccine that can then be made available uh, to the public uh, at an affordable price. Because remember what really makes products expensive is really the intellectual property aspect because then the inventor will indicate that they have invested quite a bit in research. So legally, uh, it would be possible to grant a compulsory license. Of course, it would be, in my estimate, very, very immoral if compulsory license is not granted, because it would then be considered as an essential vaccine at that point in time. Uh, when it comes to the second question, I have not followed uh, these proceedings. However, when it comes to trademark, and of course, you know, we also have a rule in the legal fraternity that we do not discuss the merits of an ongoing case. And so we can then perhaps create a scenario touching on the, uh, touching on the, the criteria, touching on the criteria for registering trademarks. From the question, in as much as I have not followed this case, that Apple has brought in a, what we call an opposition simply means that the company that proceeded to register peer 
through whichever, I'm guessing maybe USPTO, United States Trademark and, and uh, Patent Office, must have gone through the, 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 the motions. A search was conducted, and I'm sure the office did not have any issue with, uh, with granting a trademark uh, to the company that, one, that, that, that intends to register here uh, as a trademark. So that there is an opposition would now mean that the matter is, has been brought before perhaps a registrar, if it is in Kenya here, it's been brought before a registrar. And uh, it will be interesting if this case is going on to find out what the decision would be. But from where I sit, the fact that there is an opposition simply means that the office, the, 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 the national office does not see or does not have any reason to prevent the trader from registering uh, the pair. Uh, I could also, I could also perhaps, and again, you know, I'm, 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 I'm really, I really don't have the facts here, but I can also refer to the technicalities that are involved in registration of a trademark. By the time when you're conducting a search, you have to refer to the NIST classification that has got various classes under which registration is done. For example, if, if PEAR is a software company, uh, then perhaps I am seeing the fear that Apple has because of the possibility of a confusion, okay, uh, that may take place uh, among very average consumers who may not perhaps know how to differentiate between Apple uh, accessories and, and, and computers and this particular one. But if the owner of pair comes from a different industry and is registering this particular uh, sign under a different class, say a class of clothing, for example. Okay, again, I have to just use these scenarios. There would really be, in my estimate, nothing that would prevent uh, the trademark office from proceeding with uh, granting this particular uh, mark. Remember that sometimes names or even marks can be similar, but the same can be in different classes. A very good example, we have three Vivos in this country. We have Vivo Energy. We have Vivo uh, Volkswagen, the vehicle that is being assembled uh, in, uh, in Thika. And we also have Vivo line of clothing. All of them have the same names, but they are registered trademarks. Why? Because they've been registered under different classes. It would be ridiculous to say that a consumer cannot differentiate between clothing and petroleum products or clothing and, and uh, and, 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 and a vehicle, a Volkswagen vehicle. So there are times when, depending on the class under the NIST classification, uh, the national offices can proceed and uh, register uh, names and marks, even if they are actually similar. SMEs, how can, how can SMEs, uh, uh, benefit from intellectual property. SMEs can benefit from intellectual property in many ways. And I can give one example. Uh, 
a trademark is the very beginning of entering into a franchise arrangement. A franchise arrangement is an arrangement that first world countries understood very many years ago. Because one, it is your property that you hire out. It is like having a flat and then you rent it out to a tenant. That is really the science behind franchising. So you have a brand and you hire it out as long as now the other rules of franchising uh, are put in place. Uh, of late, Kenya is, has now joined other countries where a certificate of trademark, if the trademark is valued, can actually earn an SME alone. So you do not even need to have a title deed to land in order for you to earn, to get a loan from the bank. Why? Because your intellectual property asset itself has a value and has been valued by a certified intellectual property lawyer for a certain amount of money and the bank will proceed and take that certificate as a collateral because they can actually sell it. So it's, 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 it, it, it's you know, one of the examples that uh, I can give here uh, uh, for SMEs uh, in particular uh, in leveraging, leveraging of intellectual, uh, on inter uh, leveraging on intellectual property, uh, property assets. And again, you know, depending on what this SME deals, deals in, if it's an SME that is in the manufacturing business, then of course it just has to invest in uh, research and development, uh, get its hands in information that is at the various uh, patenting offices, and uh, proceed with reverse engineering for free because the information on, <laughs> on expired patents lies in the patent offices for the take. It's up for takes without referring to the, to, to the owner, okay? Several companies, and I won't name names, uh, several companies, are in serious, serious competition simply because they have invested in their research and development department where all they do is a lot of, you know, reverse engineering because all the information, all the disclosure now in patent is there, is, is, is theirs for, for the taking. So it's, it's very, very possible to leverage, to leverage on intellectual property. And you see, once you have a patent, and this is also another thing that must be explained here. Once you have a patent, it's property. And you can only, you can only benefit if you commercialize it. It's not about you saying that, hello, I have a patent. No, you go out there and look for partners that are interested and you enter into arrangements, you license it out to them at a fee so that they can use the invention. That is now healthy competition so that they can also benefit, uh, but at a fee while you, 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 you concentrate on your research. And there are so, so many uh, SMEs that uh, around the world that the only thing they do is researching on patents and entering into, into patent uh, uh, licensing. That's how they make their money. So it's, 
it's 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 very very possible sarah Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, William, uh, for taking us through the, the questions. Uh, we appreciate uh, the tutorial that you have taken us through. We have had some uh, comments in the chat, uh, the participants appreciating uh, what uh, you have been able to take us through. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have come to the end of our tutorial today. Uh, this has been our session on intellectual property dispute resolution series, uh, part one. Uh, during this uh, particular part one, we have been able to look at uh, patents, we have been able to look at uh, copyright, we have been able to look at uh, related rights as well as uh, trademarks. Uh, on the 3rd of September uh, 2020, which is next week on Thursday afternoon, again at two o'clock. Uh, we shall have part two of this tutorial series. Uh, during the part two of the series, we will be able to look at uh, geographical indications, industrial design and fair competition, international registration, new plant varieties, as well as traditional knowledge and IP and uh, development. Uh, we welcome you to be able to join us uh, next week on Thursday as we have uh, part two of this uh, particular tutorial series. We will also be able to uh, address additional questions during that uh, particular session. Uh, once again, uh, uh, Malimo William, thank you very much. And thank you participants for being able to stay through. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your comments. We will close uh, again uh, with the, the words of the Kenyan National Anthem, being able to recite that in English. O God of all creation, bless this our land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity, peace and liberty. Plenty be found within our borders. Uh, thank you once again. I have been your moderator, Sarah Ter. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for the opportunity. And all the best uh, to the participants.